Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Very warm welcome to this open forum number 13, Human Rights and AI Wrongs, who is responsible. It's my great pleasure to be your moderator this afternoon, and I would uh, like to uh, introduce the members of the panel that will lead the discussions. Uh, to my right, Joe McNamee, who is a member of the Council of Europe's Committee of Experts on Human Rights Dimensions of Automated Data Proce uh, Processing and Different Forms of Artificial Intelligence. Uh, he also has had a lot of other responsibilities, which you'll find on the CV. I'll do a, a bridge version. If you agree, uh, then to my right, Mr. David Reichel from, from the Fundamental Rights Agency of the European Union, uh, head of research and data. To my left, uh, Ms. Clara Neppel, Senior Director of IEEE, and uh, Ms. Cornelia Kuttera, Senior Director at Microsoft, responsible for EU government affairs, privacy, and digital policies. Artificial intelligence is having an increasing impact on all our lives, and as experts, uh, which you all are, I don't have to go into the details. The Council of Europe organized uh, earlier this year a conference in Helsinki which was entitled Governing the Game Changer. And that title, I think, sums up the uh, impact and the challenges we are, we are facing. A whole series of issues arise out of the increased application of AI, uh, whether it be by companies, whether it is by governments. Um, and these challenges relate to the design, the development, and the application of AI systems. At the Council of Europe, we have so far looked at the matter from a, um, a vertical perspective, if you like, several sectors have produced guidelines on particular uses of AI, for instance, AI and racism and antisemitism, AI and data protection, um, AI and culture, etc. Earlier this year, the, in May, following the Helsinki conference, uh, our governance for 47 uh, governments decided to uh, start working on a legal framework for the development and, and application, design development and application of AI. Uh, and the committee set up to do that, which is called CAHAI, met for the first time in Strasbourg last week. It is a unique effort. Uh, to my knowledge, it is the first international effort to go beyond the ethical frameworks that exist, and there are about 200 of them, uh, and to try to establish a legal framework uh, with, of course, uh, rights and obligations to ensure that AI is a force for the good. I leave it at, here, uh, at this here, and I would like to invite uh, Joe McNamee to kick off the discussions. Joe, please. Thank you very much. Um, I had the honor to be a member state representative on the expert committee that Jan just mentioned on preparing a report and a draft recommendation on addressing the impacts of algorithms on human rights. As usual for the Council of Europe, it was a meaningfully uh, multi-stakeholder process involving academic experts, civil society, industry, and member state representatives. It also included a successful and very diverse public consultation, which produced some very insightful and very constructive responses. The outputs of that committee are of a very high quality, and we believe that there will be an asset for future policy development in this area and uh, are obviously available on the Council of Europe website. I also um, had the opportunity to participate in a truly excellent Council of Europe event under the Finnish presidency called Governing the Game Changer. I warmly recommend watching the videos which are still online together with the resolution that was adopted at the event and a summary. It was unique in my experience because I've never heard one person say this conference was the best conference I've ever been at. And uh, this was an event where multiple people said this is the best ever. So uh, it's definitely uh, worth taking a look at the videos. 
The one thing that's become obvious to me in the two years of discussions that I've been involved in at the Council of Europe about AI is that AI isn't magic. We shouldn't talk about it like it's magic. It cannot do everything. It cannot plan everything. It is generally owned and implemented by the powerful. Its victims are rarely powerful. There are things it can do. There are things it can't do. This is why the recommendation underlines in its preamble the need to ensure that racial, gender, and other societal and labor force imbalances that have not been yet eliminated by, from our societies are not deliberately or accidentally perpetuated through algorithmic systems. When it comes to policy making, I'd like to uh, borrow and stretch an analogy used by one of the other speakers, um, Clara, at the Game Changer event. Imagine if we talked about air travel the way we talk about AI. Who should be responsible for inconceivably complex passenger airliners? An, airline could have an airliner can have millions of parts delivered by hundreds of suppliers. Is it really possible to allocate responsibility in case of failure? Should we really restrict airline innovation by regulating safety? Of course we should. It would be, it would be preposterous to suggest otherwise. However, somehow, under a cloak of techno magic, this is how we talk about artificial intelligence. Of course, airlines are able to avoid paying tax on fuel, uh, and they impose their externalities on the planet in the form of CO2 emissions. Unlike big tech companies that are accused of avoiding paying tax and expose their, impose their externalities in the form of pollution of democracy. We need to understand that these externalities of, um, of AI can cause real harm to real people. And those people are generally the least well able to defend themselves. We have to identify and regulate the externalities, and we have to enforce the regulation. It must not be profitable to cause harm. It must not be profitable to cause significant risk. And we must radically accept the notion that some applications of technology are not acceptable in a democratic society. We need to understand the, the peculiar economics of data to fight actively, energetically, and successfully against monopolies and to promote competition. We must avoid getting sidetracked by lobbying buzzwords like innovation as if predictable frame, legal frameworks were a burden. We need to avoid getting sidetracked by lobbying buzzwords like ethics as if subjective buzzwords are a meaningful replacement for a predictable legal framework. And to quote somebody that I don't know, called Natasha on Twitter, the future was supposed to be Star Trek. Instead, we're getting Mad Max. Let's get back to Star Trek. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Joe. Now pass the floor to uh, David Reisel from our partner and sister organization, European Union Fundamental Rights Agency. Please, David. Thank you very much. Um, yes, so I work for the EU Fundamental Rights Agency, which is one of the slightly more than 40 uh, EU agencies, and our main mandate and task is to provide the EU institutions and its member states with data and analysis on fundamental rights-related issues. When I say fundamental rights, you can read this as human rights, um, but fundamental rights is enshrined as in the Charter of Fundamental Rights applicable to the European Union. Um, so, so we are also running a, a project, a larger project on artificial intelligence and fundamental rights, looking into concrete use cases. Um, and only today I uh, would like to take the opportunity to announce we published a paper on a facial recognition technology and its fundamental rights implications, um, which is available on our website. And this paper also addresses several of the questions at stake that are discussed in, in this session. Um, so let me start by when this, the question was posed for this open session on who is responsible for human rights. It was mentioned quite often, but we have to repeat it very often again. It's the state that is responsible to observe human rights. Um, and this is especially so when the state is using uh, AI uh, for, for public administration, for example. And the state is responsible if some AI would uh, lead to violations of human rights to come up with safeguards in possible regulation. The most important tool we have to uh, um, counteract human rights violation when using uh, AI, it was also mentioned a few times, but this is, uh, in my view, is a human rights impact assessment. 
Impact assessments are available in existing data protection law, like the General Data Protection Regulation, the Convention 108 Plus, and it's also recommended by several stakeholders. I think it's the best tool that we have at this time um, to um, counteract human rights violations using AI, because the main problem we have these days is the lack of knowledge on the uses and the workings of artificial intelligence. Um, it was mentioned in the, by my previous speaker, and there's still a lot of science fiction talk around the use of artificial intelligence. People think on, or about Terminator, people think about the movie Minority Report and other Hollywood movies. Where what is happening and what is developed has nothing to do with science fiction. Um, there is no autonomous AI or there is no computer that programs itself, at least I haven't seen one. So it's important to really look into concrete uses of artificial intelligence of what it does and where the harms come. However, although there's no science fiction, there's still quite some challenges in evaluating the possible violations of artificial intelligence. One problem is that usual machine learning algorithms are based on training data, which means historical data. The computer uses this data to find some rules that can then be applied in real world. However, we're quite limited to go beyond this training data and often cannot evaluate what happens then on the ground when it's deployed in practice. One example is also that the percentages about performance we often hear reported are just based on some training data and we do not know what this means in real life. We refer to this, for example, when it comes to facial recognition, to the number of false positives and false negatives. They always need to be evaluated on real numbers in a specific context. Um, another problem is, of course, copyright. So often information is not available to do a proper human rights impact assessment. When public administration would use uh, or procure AI, a good recommendation is to request the necessary information to be able to do a proper human rights impact assessment. This is what we recommend uh, in the, this paper um, on facial recognition technology, but was also recommended by others. Another problem is linked to the lack of knowledge, the understanding of what algorithms do. Often people speak about black boxes so that we can't understand what's going on under the hood of an algorithm. I think we, don't, we shouldn't buy this as such, because there's quite a lot of research and opportunities to learn about how algorithms work. First of all, starting by describing what are the training data that are used to build the algorithm. Secondly, there are many more issues of looking into the main predictors and so forth. And once we've done this, we increased our standing already quite a lot. However, one uh, other point is that was also discussed, and that's part of the draft recommendations on the impact of algorithms from the Council of Europe expert group, is that there are, for some cases, limited opportunities to do real-world experimentation, because we cannot experiment on humans um, for certain use cases, of course. And this means that we do not know the exact impact of certain AI in the uh, real world. And this means that we even more have to invest more into the human rights impact assessment before. Um, so, I'm, I'm closing by yeah, reiterating the importance of the human rights impact assessment in context, because it's quite challenging to have an overarching statement on certain technologies. We see this with facial recognition technology. There are so many different ways, in, ways it can be applied and used, and it's so difficult to find a general statement of the impacts. But what is important when human rights are assessed to consider the full range of human rights um, and discuss yeah, all the different balances against each other. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Um, we've often heard that, at least some pretend, that setting standards or technical standards or otherwise would hamper innovation. I think IEEE is a very good example of demonstrating that that is not the case and very pleased to give the floor to Clara Neppel, the director. Thank you. So, um, thank you, Joel, also for mentioning the very nice conference in Helsinki. I agree, it was one of the best conferences I was in. Um, so, I think that uh, it was at that conference that I introduced the concept of informed trust. And in this uh, presentation, I would like to, to see what this means for AI. Um, so, first of all, I would like to start with something positive. First of all, um, AI can definitely do a lot of good. So I just read uh, that AI can predict with a very high accuracy uh, 
epilepsy attacks. Now you can imagine to what extent this is really um, contributing to the, to the well-being of the people affected. However, as you can see now on the screen, there are certain uh, cases where AI is not working so well. Maybe some of you know already this example, but uh, here the, the dog, um, the last one, the poor dog was not recognized as being a dog because here it was quite evident uh, it was a snow detector and not a, a wolf and dog detector. So um, when we talk about um, AI, we also have to think about um, what are the measures to increase this trust. And uh, what we say is informed trust is important because otherwise you have basically two options. The one option is that uh, you don't have information of what is in this black box. Then there is distrust and you will not use the technology at all. As we saw now for the epilepsy uh, example, that would not be a good solution. Uh, the other alternative is that you have blind trust. And that, again, is not a good solution because you might use the technology in a way that is not foreseen. So we are a standard setting organization, but we are also an association of engineers and technology scientists, and we publish uh, quite a lot. And now some of our stakeholders say they are uncomfortable to um, publish some data sets because they might be used in a way that was not designed. So what are the ways to disclose of what is inside this black box? Well, you all, we all heard about the principles, and they are 80 or 200, I think, that it varies. Um, I think it's important to start with those principles. But then it's important to define also what we mean by those principles. Uh, transparency can mean something completely di different for me and for you. Uh, transparency can mean uh, for one of us uh, to uh, have an understanding of why a robot uh, recommended something, for, for instance, for elderly people to take the medication. For others, it might be really the technical details of how it was designed. So, definition of principle is important. Then it's important to understand how to achieve how to achieve that, what, what we want to, you know, as a transparency being one of the important uh, examples, for instance. And ultimately, it's then also important to prove that somebody actually uh, satisfies those requirements. So one way to do this, it's not the only way, one way to do this is, oh, I'm sorry, it's very, um, it's very small, but one way to do it is, is through standards. Standards is basically nothing else but a consensus um, setting or, uh, mechanism. And in IEEE, we started with um, these principles to practice quite soon. Uh, we started with the principles three or four years ago, and almost in parallel, we started uh, developing some concrete tools on how to make, as if you want, so the recipe of um, achieving what the principles were told us. So uh, we are now working on um, standards, which are technical standards uh, on interoperability, but also on what you would call ethical standards or impact standards, which range from how to um, put ethics into the code, uh, ethical system design, if you want, so system thinking, to new measures on how to measure the impact of the AI solutions. And Almost, also very soon, we started with certification, actually in, in Helsinki, uh, by a public-private uh, partnership who was the initiator of that. And for the moment, those uh, three certification uh, threats, uh, if you want to, or series, are on transparency, accountability, and algorithmic bias. As you see, we are also engaged in, other, uh, in education and in uh, going into more in the verticals. What does it mean, ethical AI and design for businesses, for artists, health, even parenting, and so on. And since we are working, uh, talking here about AI wrongs, I think we have to talk also about accountability. I just give here an example, which you unfortunately cannot read, but this is more or less, um, uh, let's say, the structure of one possible way of how accountability requirements can be set out. We have some, uh, some inhibitors, uh, as you can see. Some of the inhibitors would be to rubber stamp, for instance. 
and there are some uh, evidence that can be uh, that can be audited, uh, such as uh, transparency, as a matter of fact, um, and and clear procedures that are in favor of uh, these accountability. So this is just an example of uh, how we set up the certification uh, program. Basically, I just wanted to give you an example of how, let's say, standards can, can uh, standards and certification can um, be a part of the solution to build this informed trust, which is necessary for AI solution. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Clara, for this presentation. I would now like to invite uh, Cornelia Kutter from uh, Microsoft to give her perspective. Cornelia, please. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to participate in this panel. Microsoft is a strong supporter of the Council of Europe, and I swear we have not uh, made this up, but I also um, was very, very uh, uh, delighted um, uh, to, to participate in the Helsinki conference, but I want to be a little bit more precise, so if you ever go to the website, um, my, my uh, favorite intervention was from Paul Mahoney, former chair of the uh, European Court of Human Rights, who gave an excellent analysis how under the Human Rights Convention, artificial intelligence can be judged and how this human rights framework is um, technology um, uh, uh, neutral in a way, and I think this was one of the best interventions I have heard in how um, AI will be and is based on rule of law. Um, so I want to, to give a little bit insights in what we are currently doing and how I think also the draft recommendations play an important role. Uh, as David already said, of course, um, the, the adherence to fundamental rights is a state uh, uh, matter, and they have to put the laws in place. And I think now we are in a, in a stage where we have to review largely where there is gaps and where we need to fill, fill in those gaps. Um, Microsoft started around three years ago uh, uh, to develop its principles, and I think we have seen over the last two, three years across the globe uh, the development of ethical principles in the context of AI. Largely, I think this, is, this was a, um, a reflection period where people really thought about what do we want this technology to do and what we want this technology not to do. But of course, once we have established these principles, and they're, they're, they're fairly homogeneous across the world, uh, certainly, um, those that uh, have been developed by the OECD or by the High Level Group on AI of the European Commission. Um, we have started uh, to, to think a, in a, in a cross-group uh, effort across the company at a high, highest level um, uh, through an AI and engineering uh, a group to, to actually go in, in the details of how you can uh, how you can implement these principles into practice. Um, that is one of the reasons that Brad Smith, our president and chief legal officer, has established recently the uh, Office of Responsible AI, which is currently tasked to really do four things. First of all, it is developing a fairly um, in encompassing uh, responsible AI life cycle, which really starts in how do you actually um, transform these principles into engineering guidance so that engineers that are starting to think and vision uh, tools and projects, that they can in, in incorporate the principles um, in, into this process. And it is a process. It really starts with envisioning, defining, prototyping, building, launching, and evolving around those AI tools. Um, then we, we also have, and, and you will see that there is a, a certain, uh, anal a, a certain um, analogy to, to the draft recommendations. We have also an escalation um, 
model um, so that when we talk to customers and when our uh, sales organizations contract around tools on AI that there can, when they see issues around sensitive uses, that we have an escalation model, which goes back to the Office of Responsible AI uh, to make decisions when we believe that in certain circumstances our principles cannot be adhered to uh, and what that means. Um, then we also um, do believe that we need to empower our customers to think about the responsible life cycle, which is an end-to-end -end thought. It does start with developing AI tools, but of course, given, given the, po the power that was already talked about of these tools and how they evolve once they are used, uh, customers also have to think about uh, how to be responsible in, in the deployment of AI tools. Um, so here we, we, we have started to also help customers and give guidance to our customers in how to, um, how to think through the issues uh, around um, AI. Largely then at, at the last, and this, this brings me back to the Council of Europe, we are focused on helping to develop uh, policy and, and engage with uh, stakeholders in, such as this forum in what are the type of laws we, we need. And we have uh, one particular uh, area that we have where we clearly said we need laws, which is um, the use of facial recognition. Not all uses of facial recognition, of course, are um, problematic. Um, you can detect uh, images, um, people in images without identifying those people. You can uh, verify uh, people in one-to-one -one verification systems, which are largely um, not problematic uh, in the context of human rights. And then, of course, you have the identification, which can, if misused, uh, lead to surveillance situations. Um, in all of those, you need to, to think through what are the responsibilities of the developers of the AI tools and what are the responsible responsibilities of the deployers of the tools. And in particular, in government uh, context, we do believe that there are certain areas that require a legal basis. And I will stop here, and then we can go in the details in the, the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cornelia. I'd like to invite the, um, the panelists to comment on each other's presentations, perhaps starting again with Joe. Uh, I agreed quite energetically with most of what I heard, so I don't have uh, many comments. Um, I think the facial recognition uh, topic is one that definitely needs um, uh, much, for, much more reflection. Uh, it's really good that the uh, Fundamental Rights Agency has pushed the debate forward and um, it's good that we have a, an industry representative on, on the panel that, um, that also wants a legal framework within, within which we can, we can operate. So, um, um, so all good. <laughs> David. Thank you. Yes, I think there's a lot of uh, agreement, um, but I mean, let me also highlight the importance because we, we have different representatives here also on the panel of, of working together on the topic. I mean, it's really important to have interdisciplinary work when we want to understand the human rights implications of artificial intelligence, because there are so many different elements that play together. Then I just also want to add, because there's a discussion that, I mean, we have already a, a quite good legal framework uh, available also to apply on AI. Um, as I mentioned before, the GDPR has a very, very many good provisions in there that can be applied also to modern artificial intelligence. For example, the provisions on automated decision making. Um, and, but what we also need to learn in the future as we go along is how this legal framework will be applied in different uh, use cases. And I think this is a very exciting and interesting time where we see how the current tools we have will be applied. The GDPR also f uh, mentions discrimination uh, in the text, which is in, uh, and one of the most important uh, human rights violations that can be done when using artificial intelligence. We have a very strong uh, anti-discrimination uh, legislation in the European Union, which also applies 
applies to the use of artificial intelligence. However, as mentioned before, it's, it's not so easy to detect, for example, when discrimination occurs, because there are several different reasons how discrimination can happen, for example, through bias data, just reflecting existing discrimination practices, which are then perpetuated or even reinforced through algorithms. Unrepresentative data, we learned on facial recognition, if it's mainly trained on white male faces, then it will not work well for black women, especially, which was shown by some research. But then, even when the data are fine, there could still be differences which are difficult um, to interpret. And in this way, discussing existing human rights on the use of artificial intelligence also really helps us to push forward the human rights discussions. Thank you very much. David, Clara. So, um, I noticed that uh, almost all of us also uh, recognize that it is important to work together. Uh, so, I can uh, just say that from the te technologists, um, uh, we are building these bridges. I think it is important to close the gap, basically, between legislation and the technical um, development. And, uh, one way to do this, which I think was discussed, is to sandboxing. It is also through self-regulation, but it is always. Um, I very much like you mentioned that I I, mentioned, I use the analogy between AI and uh, aviation. I I would say it's the same thing. If we, um, you know, at that time there were a lot of accidents. So what did it take? to arrive to the safety that we have right now. And basically, it is a combination of social norms, of education, of legislation, self-regulation. And I think we have to tackle all these. And for that, it is important to discuss with all stakeholders. Uh, basically, also the standards that we are developing is about recognizing the issues, the values of the users, and also of the of the people affected by the system. It doesn't have to be a user. It can be somebody who is affected by the system or society in general. So thank you for uh, bringing, uh, again, uh, many stakeholders together at this table. Thank you very much. Industry? Yes, so um, we, are, we are indeed in a very interesting phase currently. Um, and this is largely uh, my own thinking and how this will evolve now. Um, Joe, Joe was starting with the responsibilities and, and, and I think there will be an obligation almost for, for governments now to, to basically look at existing frameworks, legal frameworks from liability in particular, but also largely in, in any, any legislative framework in which AI tools will be deployed to stress test those regulatory frameworks against the human rights um, that, that exist, uh, the Human Rights Convention or the fundamental rights uh, under the European law. Um, to give you a couple of examples, so if, if governments make decisions on school um, allocation, for example, and those will be enhanced uh, by, um, by AI tools, then of course non-discrimination will be an, a central part and, and when deploying certain technologies, they will need to understand the limitations of those technologies, uh, how, how the data sets that were used play a role in, in the decision that is coming out of, of, of the tool. Uh, the algorithms that were used and how that might continuously evolve as they are using it in the system. And I think these are fairly new considerations for governments when they use technology tools. So there is a rethink that is necessary. We have looked at this in particular in facial recognition just to say that um, there are now starting decisions from DPAs but also from courts across Europe in, in analyzing, in analyzing uh, whether uh, the use of, of the technology was legitimate. And, and here it is in particular important to understand the broader sense of, of uh, human rights that come into play. And I think 
Um, one last consideration, I think there's a bit of a stress test happening now with GDPR in particular around the way uh, GDPR is described and I would also caution in only looking at GDPR as the solution. GDPR will play an important role, of course, um, but there are market safety considerations and it will really be contextual. So there is a lot of work in front of us on the development side, but then in particular in the deployment side of technology. Thank you very much. A question I would like to put to the panel is innovation versus regulation. Many of the governments we work with seem to be having an intense internal debate, uh, not to say uh, disagreement, on whether regulation would stifle, uh, whether regulation would stifle innovation. Um, and I'd be very grateful for your comments on that. Uh, thinking about the aircraft industry, which was mentioned, uh, or for instance, the pharmaceutical industry, both of which are very heavily regulated, uh, but both of which seem to be highly innovative as well. So perhaps to go in a reverse order, and Cornelia, perhaps a short comment, each of you on this, on this question, if I may. Yeah, um, I, was, I was never a particular fan of uh, uh, regulation stifles innovation slogans. Um, so I might not be the best representative um, to defend uh, uh, that myth. Um, it, maybe in, in some areas regulation diverts innovation in a different direction more than anything. Um, where human rights are considered, um, it is important uh, to allow, and this is, uh, this is an economic um, uh, category, um, the, to have baseline regulation will help companies that want to do the right thing continuously do the right thing. So baseline requirements are also needed to help companies that want to respect human rights to be innovative. Uh, oh, thank you. Um, so I, I would say um, regulation, um, so law is on, um, so I think that's also a citation, law is on a, on a sea of ethics, isn't it? So ethics is about values, and we all know innovation is also about a value proposition. So I would um, argue that if we take the values and uh, the ethics of the people into account, actually the, the value proposition is going to improve. So I think that there are some companies who already recognize this and uh, put already in their thinking, uh, in their design thinking, the ethics, the values, and also derive profits out of it. So I would say uh, if we have the right regulation which reflects the values and the ethics of the society, it will also help innovation. Thank you very much. David, please. Thank you. I think that's an important topic. Um, I mean, looking from a European perspective, we have values uh, which are agreed upon in, 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 our, in the EU treaties, and these values are not for negotiation. Um, at the same time, I also think that, I mean, solutions that would challenge these basic values are also not sustainable. We hear a lot of discussions about trust, that we need to have trust in the technology, and trust can only be maintained if we observe and consider the basic fundamental rights. I mean, we had the case of Cambridge Analytica, for example, like if we see that, for example, privacy is not taken seriously, then people will lose the trust, and this will also not make any technical uh, innovation sustainable. Um, but having that said, of course, I see there's still a lot of uncertainty as to, to the way uh, some, some laws need to be applied and in a way how data can be used. Um, and, but this is part of the, the, the finding out of these new technologies and better understanding how this, uh, for example, data can be used for research purposes in a safe, guarded way. Thank you. Joe, please. Regulation works for creating a clear, predictable, accountable framework within which everyone can operate. Self-regulation works when there is a 
vested uh, selfish interest on the part of uh, industry stakeholders to achieve a specific verifiable public policy outcome. Self-regulation never works when it is imposed as a result of a threat of regulation. I think one thing that we've, as a society, monumentally failed to do is identify that self-regulation works sometimes in some contexts. It doesn't work other times in other contexts. And we've never sat down to establish what are the characteristics of successful self-regulation and focus on self-regulation in environments where we know that it's more likely to work and avoid using it when in environments when it's less likely to work. We tend to blunder in every time uh, and make the same mistakes over and over again or accidentally get it right. Thank you very much. I'd like to open the floor to all of you, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Bertrand Petit, no search, I manage uh, think tank on AI. I would like to go back to your uh, comment on the psychos on AI. And I will tell you that three years ago, I will agree with you. Okay. But what have we learned since three years? So we learned with Cambridge Analytica that uh, with 300 likes, I know you better than your spouse or your best friends. And then we learn with the book of uh, Roger McNamee, Zucht, that uh, when you apply the technique of uh, behavior scientists, like uh, B.J. Fogg of uh, Stanford University, who teach ethic to software developer, uh, you can manipulate the behavior in a scientific way. And the little story go like that, that the students were supposed to have an end of semester uh, exercise to build the most unethical application. And they developed Instagram and they sold it uh, to Facebook. Okay? So what BJ Frog uh, took the student, it said that in order to manipulate somebody, it's easy. You have to uh, be in a three-dimensional space with your motivation, uh, your uh, easiness of doing something, and the third thing is a trigger. Okay, so when I am observed 24-7, machine learning will know exactly which trigger I will be sensitive at. Okay, so that is to say that they can manipulate us like little hamster, trigger by trigger. And the conclusion that we have been so far that in fact, uh, this business model, which are based on manipulation, uh, should be forbidden, period. Because like uh, you regulate tobacco, like you regulate alcohol, like you regulate drugs. So what do you think of that? Do you think you made any progress from three years ago? You mentioned Cambridge Analytica, but you should look at, I, I hope you read the book of uh, Roger McNamee, Zook. But clearly, we are, in, in terms of society, where you have business model, we use all the science to manipulate us. Thank you. Who would like to react from the panel? So, um, I agree with you that I think that's the most um, dangerous um, um, aspect of AI. Uh, and actually, I think uh, we are, I'm, I'm just coming back from Helsinki, which is, uh, there was a conference on data, uh, data economy. And I think that there, again, there was a lot of emphasis on the data, personal data, which I think is important. But I think less emphasis on what happens with the trained model, which basically uh, builds up the profiles that you just mentioned. And I think that this is something that we definitely have to discuss and look closer as a society and to see what are the red lines. Because I agree with you that uh, for the moment, we don't have any control of what dimensions are set up in a profile for us. We, don't, we cannot control if somebody would like to set up a psychological profile. And I think this is part of a human right that we should. Uh, be, have control of. And um, 
and also uh, then to see if that is true or not. So there is no correction mechanism around it. So I heard somebody tell uh, either it is correct and then you are in a, in a, um, in a, in a world of Orson Welles or it's not correct and you are in the world of Kafka. And I don't think that we want either of this. So I personally, this is my personal opinion, I think this is definitely something we should look closer at. Thank you very much, Clara. Before giving the floor further on, there is a microphone also going around, so if someone sitting somewhere else, and I will turn around too, uh, wants to ask a question, please raise your hand and a microphone will come. Uh, Wolfgang, was you were the first one, please. Thank Hello, my, neighbor, my name is Igor Plahuta, and I'm here because of the previous uh, guy who mentioned this uh, about this algorithm, and I'm a father. Basically, I'm here because I'm a father, and I'm very concerned. And you are talking about AI, you are talking about face recognition, and what is happening the last five years already with Facebook is exactly what this guy meant. The business model of Facebook is, and they disclaimed, they dis disclosed this, they said they, need, they wanted to find a gap in human psyche where they can keep the guys as long as possible on the website, give them in between some dopamine, to stay there and keep them busy on the website. If you follow this, uh, this um, uh, development, you can see, which is according to the implementation of internet, that the behavior of millions of kids are already changing. They are developing uh, uh, diet problems, they are developing hormone problems, and this is already happening, and we don't need to think about what we can do in five years, we need to do it now. And if we focus on IE or face, facial recognition, we have already spoiled a whole generation. And what we are going to do for this? Who would like to react? Industry. First of all, I, I can't speak uh, for Facebook. Um, I have myself um, children uh, in, in, a, in a critical uh, game addiction age. <laughs> um, there is, I think, work to be done in a number of areas, um, and I would, I would like to think that we need to, compor to, to um, compartmentalize a little bit the, the, the issues and, and where we can actually address them and how we can address them. So um, one, one era is, for example, advertising. Um, the other one is privacy, and I, I'm not sure whether GDPR has actually been able to tackle the issues that you were mentioning, uh, in particular in relation, and there's good studies around this in relation to inferred data, which is sort of what we learn from the data that is collected, which is sort of the, the, the core of knowing more than my partner knows about me, etc. So I think if we start to analyze very correctly and precisely where there are the issues, I think we will also have a better um, ability to, to, to find tools to them. And I, I do believe that there is um, a sort of a third wave uh, of privacy that we need to respect, but it's not only in the context of privacy. I do believe that um, we need to have more discussions around the responsibilities of human computing uh, interaction. It's, an, it's, it's another area, and then of course there are some areas I think um, will have to be done, and some are from a competence level, mm -hmm done at a European level or a national level. They are harder to tackle internationally, such as, for example, um, election legislation, which has been a, a, an important part on misinformation. You have national election rules that are very different from one country to another, and they need to, we need to look at how they can help eventually to, 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 to lower that problem. So the, 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 don't have a direct solution, but I think we can, if we start to portamentalize a little bit, we can actually tackle each area in a much more concrete and, and impactful, effective way. Perhaps in addition, I should uh, add that 
one of the proposals at the moment being discussed by the Council of Europe on application of AI is the question on whether a human rights impact assessment should not be made obligatory. And when we speak about human rights impact assessment, that should certainly concern an impact assessment on vulnerable categories and children being first and foremost amongst those. Um, perhaps the lady here and then... Um, hello. Luisa Klingwald from... Ah, uh, European Commission. Actually, I would like to ask about exactly uh, impact assessments. I mean, this is often being put forward as um, a kind of way forward to ensure fundamental rights compliance of AI. Um, and um, I would just like to know, because obviously the impact on fundamental rights has to be assessed in relation to the final use of a product. So in the actual legal compliance environment where it's going to be used. So uh, how do you see this being practically implemented, given that uh, AI uh, is a technology uh, where we see um, an industry or a sector that not always shows kind of full vertical uh, integration. So, I mean, obviously to do an impact assessment that the, when you're very downstream, close to the market would be quite easy, whereas upstream at an early development stage, you might not at all know the final use or the final features or the product might develop. So how do you see this in, in practice? Thank you. Thank you. I'll take that one. Um, there is no clear guidance yet available on what, what the human rights impact assessment um, would have to look like. And I think it's also challenging to, to say it in detail because there's so many different applications of AI. I mean, everyone agrees AI is quite a broad term and we also hear the different ways of application in different uh, areas. Um, so it often depends on the context, also if there's some harm or if there's no harm. But at least it's, it's, it's the only available tool we have now to have on a general level to look into transparently what is being done in a specific context. And for example, to look into the accuracy of predictions. It was mentioned before how we deal with these inferred attributes, was mentioned by Cornelia, these attributes. What this means in practice, we can only evaluate in a specific context. And then we need to understand, is this just the predictions on the training data? Or was there some experimentation that could tell us more about it? Um, but I'm afraid there, there's no clear guidance. Um, what, what we try, for example, on facial recognition, just to discuss many different rights, starting from discrimination over data protection, freedom of expression, um, good administration as an important EU principle. And considering all these rights starts to give a bigger picture of, of where the, the problems might lie. And also, I mean, saying, while we have the GDPR as a very good tool to apply, there are also policy processes ongoing. As mentioned, the CAHAI at the Council of Europe, the Commission also says uh, there will be initiative coming up. Um, so there's clear awareness that more needs to be done. We'll see what comes up. Thank you. We have six minutes before we have to clear this room. So Wolfgang, please, and then I have a question. At the back here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank the panel for the very inspiring uh, ideas which they have given us. Um, I'm from the University of Graz, I'm an international lawyer, and uh, my concern is uh, how can we move from uh, self-regulation uh, through soft regulation uh, to regulation as such, meaning binding regulation. And as always, the Council of Europe is already in the forefront here. Uh, but uh, what I mean is, uh, it is certainly important uh, to go for responsible AI, uh, it reminds me of the slogan of Google when it, they started, do no evil. Yeah? Um, certainly, one should avoid this. Trustworthiness is important and so on. But in the end, uh, all these companies are in competition to each other. There is the stakeholder value, there is the pressure from the market, there is the cost factor and so on. So in the end, I think it is not only in the interest of the user, um, it's also in the interest of the business uh, to have clear rules which are binding on all. And these rules should, if possible, be global, yeah? because we have a global situation. And they should apply on the one side to the development of certain forms, 
of artificial intelligence and then also to the use, as we have facial recognition here as the example. Uh, it has very good uses, but it is also used for surveillance, as we know. So should it be the same for a company uh, to sell it uh, to a democracy or to an authoritarian government? There should be a difference. Thank you. Um, can I, I'd just like to briefly come back to the first two questions. Um, in my presentation, I said we must accept the notion that some applications of technology are not acceptable in a democratic society. Um, so I agree with, with those speakers. I would also briefly like to, I think your two questions raised a very important point in terms of giving data in return for free services. That's not what's happening. You are not giving data on the, in order to allow Facebook to know you better than you know yourself. You're not clicking like in order to give a kid a do dopamine hit in order to keep them on the website. It's, that's not the transaction. And as long as we keep pretending that's the transaction, we will not make any progress. Um, on um, the, the most recent question that was asked, um, I think we need to really think about self-interest. Generally speaking, it is in the interests of the market as a whole to have regulation uh, that is clear and predictable. Um, if there is a vested interest in the market as a whole to achieve a public policy outcome uh, by self-regulation, then um, we can predictably expect that self-regulation will achieve its goal and we don't necessarily need regulation. As I was saying a moment ago, what we need to do is know which is which. And um, I think we, all, we need to be clear what outcomes that we want and we need to be clear on um, the, um, the likelihood that industry will want to achieve the same outcomes or will seek to exploit the lack of legislation. Um, I think if we talk about self-regulation as if it's the same in every context, then we'll keep on making the same mistakes over and over again. Um, so interests is the answer uh, to the self-regulation, soft law and regulation in, in my view. Thank you. Then perhaps one last question. I think there was a question here behind. Hello, everyone. Um, glad to be here, and thanks for the very nice uh, dialogue. To be part of this multi-stakeholder environment is very good for the youth. My name is El Nur. I'm coming from Azerbaijan as the IGF Youth Ambassador 2019. Uh, I'm here to actually, obviously, representing the youth voice. Uh, as before the IGF uh, started, we, uh, we organized the IGF Youth Summit and uh, we discussed different issues, including the AI and its impact in our lives. And we drafted together with the youth all from around the world, tw 11 messages. And one of the messages is about the, how to regulate the AI in our modern world. You know, all the discussions, not only in this session, but in other sessions are like, we should, we should regulate AI to protect ourselves. But another question is that, can we really trust, trust humans to regulate? So our message is how human intervention can be regulated. I will read the, it briefly as it's a brief message. Human intervention must guide AI-driven decision-making to ensure explainability, inclusivity, privacy, accountability, and the right to appeal. It shall occur whenever the decision rendered had disruptive personal consequences, especially for vulnerable groups such as the youth. So this is the voice of the youth who we think that whenever there is a human inter intervention in the AI, it should also be uh, regulated by certain principles, and these certain principles shouldn't be uh, restricted to the human rights itself, but uh, international uh, principles 
And what we mean by the disruptive personal consequences is the application of the AI in the education and health and the other sectors that have direct impact on our lives. So thank you very much. That's, that was a just a kind comment from the voice of the youth who are really glad to be part of the, this multi-stakeholder approach and we hope in the future we will have a direct impact in the IGF uh, forum. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this. Before closing, I would like to give the panelists the chance to give one more sentence before we end. One sentence, please. I maybe I just comment on the last intervention. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, I think it, it, at the end of the day, shows that AI is there to support uh, human uh, genuity uh, and not vice versa. And we are in a, in a situation where we can reflect a lot on how our systems are made through AI, but it should not be the other way around. Regulation is definitely needed in, in certain areas, uh, and we should start really the process in looking at where and when we need these safeguards. Sorry. Yes, um, again, coming back to what was just said, um, one third actually of the internet users are un under 18. And well, I can assure you that uh, there are not many products who are designed to take this into account. So I think um, all future developments should first take into account, so first recognize, for instance, this issue. Um, and uh, then if we are discussing, we have to take into account the whole life cycle in AI. We have to, the input data and all the issues around privacy, but that's not enough. What we heard, the important value is around the aggregated data, what we are associated with, and the goals for which AI is developed. And I think for all these, we need transparency and um, mechanisms and ways to correct and uh, audit. Thank you very much. Thank you very briefly. I also I liked very much the last intervention, and I think it's important, especially for youth, to increase the understanding of, of, of artificial intelligence. It was mentioned we also have a provision in the GDPR on the right to human review in terms of automated decision making. Um, and here, it's, this is a very important one, and here it's important to also increase our knowledge about human machine interaction. I mean, does a human review mean that the person is just signing off whatever the machine says, rendering the human review irrelevant? Or there's even research showing that the human over, overrides a decision from the machine and it, it could even go to the worse. So I think the hu machine-human interaction is an important um, avenue for future research as well. Um, and as a closing sentence, sorry for saying too, uh, is that a lot is going on, a lot of processes are happening these days, and I just want to encourage everyone from her, his perspective to contribute to this discussion to get it right. Thank you, Joe. Um, briefly, I'd, I'd like to um, go back to what Louisa from the European Commission uh, said about um, upstream um, diligence and uh, awareness of possible uses. Um, I think one thing that hasn't been mentioned and tends not to be mentioned is we're faced with very restrictive intellectual property and trade secrets rules that are going to get in the way and are going to stop a balance being struck. And we need to think about how to ensure that legislation that was not intended for this purpose is not designed for this purpose could, uh, could stop us achieving um, human rights objectives in, in relation to the application of AI. Thank you, Joe. In closing, let me stress that at the Council of Europe, in our legal standard setting, we will closely consult with civil society, with youth, with industry, of course, with governments. I thank you all for your presence, for your participation. I would like to invite you for a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you very much.